friend in town of Boston, uh, there's a very lengthy and distinguished professional biography he has, which I won't go into all, all the detail, but let me just say this. Most of us in life aspire to be successful and accomplished at one job. Uh, if we do that, we can feel like we've uh, had some you know, professional accomplishment. Talmadge has somehow managed to be very successful and accomplished in two jobs. Uh, his day job, of course, is a partner with the Winston Law Firm and a leader with the State Bar of Texas. Uh, but his night and morning job has been uh, as a historian, particularly a scholar of the presidency. And even more of that, as a scholar of scholars who study the presidency. Uh, like a good lawyer, he keeps uh, us other scholars honest. I know my friend Jeremy Suri's here, he's finishing a great book on the American presidency, too. I'm sure you can look forward to being cross examined by Talmadge for uh, volume two of this he, book. He said it all. Not that okay. Said it. Anyway. Um, so, uh, Tal during his abundant free time, uh, the Talmadge, uh, uh, irony intended, uh, Talmadge has produced this fantastic book here, Cross Examining History. Of course, the title itself embodies his two avocations. Uh, and so, he's going to give us uh, not just a summary of the book, but rather distilling uh, the lessons and insights he takes away from it, especially timely as our nation's going through our every four year. A constitutional ritual of selecting a new a new president. So he's going to give us the uh, ten suggestions. One might even say the ten commands for that. So uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tom Schwab. Thank you, Will, for that kind introduction. It is great to be back here at the University of Texas, where I graduated undergrad in 1975, law school in 1978. And uh, this building has special meaning. Uh, I was told this most beautiful room on the campus, and I certainly believe it. Uh, my friend Bill Paris is here, who was involved in student politics, as was I, way back when. And I, Bill was very successful. I was less successful. Uh, and the person who beat me was even less successful, such that it created kind of this joke uh, candidates who, who won in a landslide. Uh, they were called arts and sausages instead of arts and sciences. And uh, the, the theme was that on, on the main building, you know, are the, the important words, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And they said what they really ought to put on the main building is, is really the way this university works, the most important words that they go around here, and that is money talks. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if the campus and its politics and uh, had changed in, in 40 years, but that was the way it was uh, when I was here. Uh, it is, uh, it is a, a timely night to be talking about presidential history. We're now about 45 days away from November the 8th when the country at long last will finally decide who's going to become the 45th President of the United States. Uh, I suspect that many of you here already know who you're going to vote for, although the recent polls suggest there may be as many as 20% who have not yet decided. And obviously, the choice this year is, shall we say, complicated, given that both of the candidates have extraordinarily high uh, negative approval ratings uh, above <coughs> 50%. So the good news is tonight, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to say anything good or bad about either of the candidates. What I am going to do is give you some food for thought from the pages of presidential history with the idea that it will give you something new and substantive to consider uh, between now and election day when you cast your vote. Now, I suspect many of you uh, love history. Uh, you probably wouldn't be here if you weren't. And you probably reached the same conclusion that I did years ago. And that is, most people love history for two reasons. The first reason is because it shows us how much things change. And the second reason is because it shows us how much things stay the same. And one of the main ways that history shows us how much things stay the same is that the traits that make for great presidential leadership are the same in 2016 as they were in 1789 when George Washington got sworn in. Now for my new book, Cross-Examining History, <coughs> after completing my 31 interviews with presidential experts, I synthesized what I had learned, or part of what I had learned, into what I call the Ten Commandments of Presidential Leadership. Now, I recognize that this audience is filled with leaders, leaders in education, leaders in 
lived in the law, leaders in business, leaders in civic organization. And I believe that these uh, commandments on leadership apply to all leaders uh, because they come from the men who met the toughest decisions of their era and, and, and handled them in a way that set the standard, not only in presidential leadership, but, but for all in, in leadership. And when I interviewed former White House Chief of Staff John Sununu for my book, he gave a, he made a very important point. He said, nothing happens in our federal government without presidential leadership. Congress cannot take prompt action because they are truly a herd of cats. Those are his words. And the president, and only the president, has to manage the process or else it doesn't get managed at all. And when he said that, I reflected on it, it reminded me of something that the great baseball Hall of Famer Reggie Jackson had once said about his time when he was the star with the New York Yankees. He always described himself as the straw who stirred the drink. And so if Reggie Jackson was going to try to make Johnson in his point, he would say in our federal government, it's the president who's the straw that stirs the drink. So keeping those points in mind about the important role of the president, the, the straw who stirs the drink, clearly from a historical standpoint, the most important through line in American history from 1789 to today, let's get now go into these Ten Commandments and each of the presidents who epitomize them. And to help you remember them, as I go through the remarks, uh, my remarks, I will uh, identify at the end of them the, the tie to that president's namesake landmark in Washington, D.C. First commandment, a great leader shall be conscience in chief. Now we're always saying the president's being the commander in chief. But the great leader also serves as conscience in chief. That is, high, high, high integrity, a moral compass that's always locked on true north so we can count on the leader to do the right thing when times get tough or when he thinks no one is looking. And the president who set the standard as conscience in chief was our first president, George Washington, who was the subject of uh, award-winning historians David and Jean Heidler. They had a big book called Washington Circle, came out in early 2015, huge review in the Wall Street Journal. She's a professor of history at the Air Force Academy, and I went to uh, Colorado Springs and interviewed them in front of the <coughs> history class at the Air Force Academy. And when I talked to them, I, mean, I just wanted to focus on the nature of Washington's integrity, where it came from, how did it manifest itself, and, and what they said was, first of all, there was a, a physical component to it. George Washington was a large man. He was six foot two. And when his, in his era, that would be like being six foot eight today in comparison to, to, the, to the average height of others. So here he had this very large man, but he also had these penetrating pale blue eyes. He had a broad, lion-like nose. And whenever he would speak, he always spoke very slow. And he did that to make sure that he never misspoke. So you had this unique, large presence, strong eyes, strong nose, and unusual way of speaking. So that whenever George Washington walked into a room, people took notice, stopped what they were doing, and immediately went into a mode of best behavior. But beyond that physical component to this moral countenance, Let's get to the real nuts and bolts. Where do you get it? Where do you get all this integrity? Well, you had parents who were you know, role models, great mentors. But the Hyder said that what really kind of injected integrity into his system was that when he was a, an early teenager, that was in that time, that's when most people learned how to do cursive handwriting. That's George Washington's autograph. You can see he was pretty good at it. And the way they learned cursive handwriting was from what they call copy books. And these were books that, you know, cursive handwriting. People had their favorite books. Washington's favorite book, copy back, uh, book, copy book, was called Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in Company and Conversation. And it was a book that had been written by Jesuit priests. 
And this book contained 110 rules of civility and decent behavior that Washington copied over and over and over again for years and years until he knew these rules backwards and forwards. And they became his code for living from that point on the rest of his life. And out of these 110 rules, I read them, two that really kind of stood out for me. The first one was, every action done in company ought to be with some sign of respect to all who are present. And then another one that really stood out, particularly on this first commandment, labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. Now, uh, that was how it got into his system and it continued throughout his life while he was president. He read devotionals daily. He went to church every Sunday. And he never took a move as president without making sure he was in total compliance with the brand new Constitution. So I said, when he died in 1799, uh, there was a, a, a prominent man, a, I guess a historian of sorts named Parson Weems, who decided we need a really great biography to commemorate the life of this George Washington. And in those days, we didn't have great libraries or research tools or or any of that. So if you aspire to write a biography and you, know, you want to fill up something that would qualify as a book, you, you did what you had to do. And in Parson Weems' case, he basically started making stuff up. And, and, and one of the most famous things he made up was that at age six, George Washington, I don't know they, George Washington said, Papa, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree with my hatchet. Now that particular story was a early 19th century version of, of an Aesop's fable, but it told the lifelong story of the, the, the breadth and depth of, of Washington's integrity. So it was all that together, the physical, the, the code, the, from the rules that he learned inside and out, the, the religious affiliation, the keeping his, his, his uh, nose to the grindstone and in constitution of adherence, all those factors combined to make him present himself and set the standard as conscience in chief. So the next time you go to Washington, D.C. and see the Washington Monument, think of it as a capital I that stands for the integrity of George Washington. Second commandment, the great leader shall stay above the partisan fray and be able to build consensus. Now, uh, building consensus is a big part of the American success story. Uh, Eclorbus unum. It's been on our money for a long time. It's Latin, obviously, and it means out of many, one. Most groups have more than one faction. It takes a great leader to bring the factions together, uh, bring them into a mode of unity, bring them into a mode of being able to work together collectively. And the president who set the standard and this commandment was Thomas Jefferson. The Jefferson uh, biographer for my book was Peter Onuf. Uh, Peter was the uh, Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor of History at the University of Virginia for many years. He's written six different books on Thomas Jefferson. And given that when I interviewed Peter in 2015, last year, <coughs> we're living in a, in, in a world where the federal government uh, is incapable, seemingly, of anybody being able to build consensus. And so I wanted to go deep with Peter in the interview. How did Jefferson do it? And particularly, he was operating at a very fragile time in our country's history when, when things were really brand new. But there was total, complete discord slash war between the Federalist Party, led by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, with the Republican Party, led by Jefferson and uh, James Madison. And the war was so uh, extreme that uh, in 1798, uh, during Adams' presidency, uh, Congress passed what was called the Sedition Act, which made it a crime punishable by incarceration for anyone to criticize the president or any of the Federalist policies. So at that totally dysfunctional time, when people were actually thrown in jail and stayed there for months and sometimes even years because they had uh, said something critical of the president. Thomas Jefferson stepped into the fray, became our third president, was sworn in, 
in early 1801, and, from, and, and he knew <coughs> we had to do something. If this country was going to survive, we had to get on the same page. We had to get into a mode where people could, could talk and work together and legislate together. And so in his first inaugural address, address very close to the, the very beginning, he said, we are all veterans, and we are all Republicans, i.e., we are all Americans. Don't you wish we had a candidate in 2016 who could talk to the people in that kind of unifying uh, approach? Uh, but to, to build consensus, you know, how do you do it? Uh, Peter Arnold went deep into, into a quote that ties into something that a recent American diplomat, Harold Saunders, had said, and that is, Politics is about relationships. So a president starts building consensus by building relationships. And how do you how do you do that? Well, Jefferson knew that if he was going to operate in, in a new administration, which obviously he hoped and it became eight years, he was going to have to build relationships with the top Federalist leaders. And so his approach to that was. Uh, he would host uh, dinner parties at the executive mansion on a regular, ongoing basis where the only invited guests were the Federalist leaders. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a very charming person, great conversations. He could talk about anything in depth and with real animation, architecture, art, music. He was a violinist, history, literature, agriculture, you name it, Thomas Jefferson could talk about it. And so as the wine flowed and the food got eaten and, and, and the conversation just ramped up, dinner party after dinner party after dinner party, lo and behold, some of the barriers came down. And, and, and he succeeded in getting a, a more unified government than had existed before he became president. Now we know what happens when we elect a, a, a president who is unable to rise above the, the partisan fray and, and, and is incapable of building relationships so as to uh, uh, build consensus, we get where we are today. We, we get a government that doesn't work. We get a government that's in gridlock. So the next time you're in Washington, D.C. and you see the Jefferson Memorial, think of the columns in that building as factions. And think of how the factions all become unified together under the perfect Jefferson Dome. And think about Thomas Jefferson, the man who made it his top priority to get people to attempt to act collectively and focus on attempting to unify the federal government. Third commandment, a great leader shall know his limitations and shall find a way to supplement his limitations. And the president who set the standard in this uh, commandment was James Madison. Now, uh, James Madison was uh, brilliant by all accounts, totally brilliant, and he was also incredibly hardworking. He had an unbelievable work ethic. But he was also five foot four. He weighed a hundred pounds, and every time that he spoke publicly, he had zero charisma. So, for example, when George Washington would enter a room, everybody knows. When James Madison entered a room, no one knows. So, he had to do something. Uh, the Jefferson, excuse me, the Madison writer from my book was award-winning historian David Stewart, whose book that came out in early 2015 was entirely about Madison's gift for forming partnerships and alliances and friendships with those who had the strengths in the areas where he was weak. So, what did Madison do to compensate for being a scrawny little guy who got lost in a crowd? He buddied up with great, big, impressive George Washington. And George Washington was smart enough to know that he wasn't brilliant. He needed somebody with more horsepower. And so he wanted to align with James Madison, and they did together side by side with the Constitutional Convention and during the early days of Washington's presidency. So what did Madison do to compensate for being short on charisma? David Stewart said he buddied up with Alexander Hamilton, the most dynamic of all of the founders. 
And Hamilton was smart enough to know that he had this big project. How are we going to get this Constitution ratified? He came up with a great idea, the Federalist Papers. But he knew he couldn't do it by himself. He needed somebody who he thought was equally brilliant and very hardworking in order to complete that task. And indeed they did. And they led the charge to get the Constitution ratified by the states. So what did Madison, who's a very level-headed, brilliant thinker, and here he is, he's trying to form the government uh, and, and make it the best that it can be, and he realized that he's missing this element of creativity. This is brand new, we want it to be the best. I need a bona fide creative thinker to, to supplement what I got. And so he aligned with Thomas Jefferson, a creative genius, who, and they ultimately became essentially best friends. And, and Jefferson was smart enough to know that, yes, he was unbelievably creative, but a lot of his ideas were wild and crazy. He needed somebody to bring him down to earth, somebody level-headed. And that's what James Madison did for him. So that was the partnership. So you got the brilliant level-headed, the brilliant creative come together. And with that kind of horsepower, no wonder that this government that they created has lasted as long and, and served us so well as what they formed. Now, uh, when you go to Washington, D.C., there's the James Madison Memorial Building at the Library of Congress. And, of course, in the Library of Congress is the original of our Constitution. And so, obviously, the <coughs> words in the Constitution only have power and meaning when they are partnered together. The words in the Constitution standing alone have no importance. So when you think about the Supreme Law and our great Constitution, think of James Madison, the man we call the father of the Constitution, and his gift for partnering with those who had the strengths in the areas that he lacked. Fourth commandment, a great leader shall persevere, have the power to persevere over setbacks. Of course, you persevere over setbacks by having steadfast resolve. And the president uh, who set the standard in persevering over setbacks was Franklin Roosevelt. The Roosevelt biographers from my book, Ken Burns, of all of you saw the PBS documentary, of course he was co-author of the book that came out with it. Uh, his collaborator, Jeffrey Ward, has written three other biographies of Franklin Roosevelt, one of which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And uh, National Book Critics Award winner James Tobin. And during my interviews with all of them, trying to focus on the essence of Franklin Roosevelt, what made him great, they all obviously kept coming, to the fact, coming back to the fact that up until the time he was 39 years old, he was unbelievably active. He loved to play golf, he loved physical recreational activities, he loved to dance, he loved to socialize, he loved to work hard for his high political ambitions, and all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, he got hit by polio in 1921 and lost the use of his legs for the rest of his life. Now, both Jeffrey Ward and James Tobin talked about his steadfast result. Yes, I've lost the use of my legs. Yes, life is difficult. I can't get around. I've got to put braces on my legs. All sorts of things that accompanied his uh, lifelong bout with polio from that point on. Yet he never lost his smile. He never, never lost his self-confidence. He never lost his desire to lead. Just so that he was a guy. And the country knew he had polio. They didn't fully understand the, 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 how bad it was. But they knew that there was, he couldn't walk without assistance, a cane, or people by his side. They knew something was wrong. And it gave him the power, as the man who had overcome this, to make the country believe in one of its darkest errors, hey, we got nothing to fear but fear itself. And by defying polio, uh, Franklin Roosevelt demonstrated the wisdom of Joseph Campbell, who said, where you stumble, there your treasures lie. When Franklin Roosevelt overcame polio, he found out he had resources of character, i.e. treasures, he didn't know he had it. He was never tested in his life with anything close to what it took to overcome polio. So there it is, the FDR Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. You look at his face, there's that strong, 
countenance, serene self-confidence. But you see the rest of his body is cloaked and he's seated so as not to draw attention to his polio-ravaged legs. So whenever you see an image of Franklin Roosevelt from after 1921, think of him as the man who, who overcame the greatest setback of any of our presence and did it because of this steadfast resolve, this commitment that nothing is going to keep me down. Fifth commandment. A great leader shall play hardball when necessary. And that is when people get out of line and challenge him, he steps up and he shows everybody on his team, in his group, in his country, hey, when it comes to achieving my goals, I mean business. I'm not going to let anybody jerk me around. I'll show them I mean business. And the president of the modern era who was particularly good at this was Dwight Eisenhower. Now, the Eisenhower biographer for my book was Pulitzer Prize finalist Gene Edward Smith. And during the interview and in his biography of Eisenhower, he told a great story about Eisenhower being so good, uh, perhaps uniquely good, at, at playing hardball. And that, that was what happened in 1956. It was one week away from the November 1956 election. Eisenhower was completing the end of his first term. He was one week away from the election that would lead to his second term. Uh, things were in a mode of peace and prosperity around the world. But all of a sudden, Great Britain, France, and Israel joined forces, invaded Egypt, and seized the Suez Canal. And they did it knowing that Eisenhower did not want that to happen. It expressly told them, you better not do that. But they thought they could get away with it because it was one week before the election and they thought Eisenhower would let it go for fear of losing the Jewish vote in the election because Israel was involved. That's what they thought. But they were wrong. As soon as it happened, Eisenhower called his Secretary of the Treasury, instructed him, make a run right now on the British pound. And he did. Then Eisenhower called the British Prime Minister, and who was aware there was something going on with the pound. And Eisenhower said, you get all of your troops out of the Suez right now, or I will drive the pound down to zero. What was that guy going to do? He had to get the troops out of the Suez. And he did it. That's how you play hardball. Didn't use a soldier, didn't use a dollar, but incredible, quick execution to get people into line who were attempting to, 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 to drag things off course in world order. Now, for many years, they've been talking about their intentions. They're going to build an Eisenhower memorial, but they've gotten hung up on exactly what's going to be in the design. So until it gets completed, which will hopefully be in the next a uh, couple of years, when you go to Washington, D.C., go to the Arlington National Cemetery, the tomb of the unknown soldier, and remember that before it was president, Dwight Eisenhower was the supreme allied commander during World War II, the architect of, of the D-Day uh, invasion, and remember that he held that position in the military, and he served with such distinction as president for many reasons, but one of the main ones was he knew how to play hardball well when necessary to keep people in line. Interestingly enough, you historians, in 1963 I was in grade school, I was already into presidential history, and uh, I, I became aware of, the, of, of a presidential ranking of historians that come out every few years. And in 1963, after he'd been out of the White House just a couple of years, Eisenhower was ranked number 22 out of 34 presidents. In other words, kind of in the middle of the bottom half. He's now rated as a top 10 president. That's how it shows how things can change over time. Very tremendously. Sometimes it takes 50 years for the dust to settle. But when Eisenhower uh, left the office, you know, he was in his 70s, he was old, he was bald, and, 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 and played a lot of golf. And he was succeeded, obviously, by this dynamic, dashing, handsome young John F. Kennedy. And so people, uh, got into a mode of, of, of thinking that Eisenhower had, had served past his his prime. And yet, down the road, decades go by, people say, you know what? During his eight years, we had nothing but peace and prosperity. 
That's something no other president's been able to do in the, in, in the last hundred years or more. I think we need to move him up on the rankings. For other reasons, because he was so good at hardball. Commandment six. A great leader shall remain calm in a crisis. You never want to let your people know you're panicking. You always want your people to know that you are in a mode where you can make good decisions. And the person in the modern era who was particularly good at this was John F. Kennedy. And the Kennedy biographer who I uh, interviewed is Sheldon Stern. Sheldon was the historian in residence at the Kennedy Presidential Library in Boston for over 20 years. And he's the author of three books on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, in October 1962, at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union delivered missiles into Cuba. And all of a sudden, uh, the United States leadership of our federal government went into uh, a crisis mode. And Kennedy pulled his brain trust together, which was called the Executive Committee. These are the famous XCOM meetings which were actually taped, unbeknownst to anybody except the two Kennedy brothers. And over the court, and, and this tape is, is over 42 hours, and for years it was not available to anybody. It finally became available for, for uh, historians to, to hear uh, in the late 90s, and Sheldon Stern was, was the first one to listen to the tapes from beginning to end. And he said that what the tapes show, contrary to what Bobby Kennedy had said, in his book, 13 Days, or what the movie with Kevin Costner had indicated, both of which kind of made Bobby Kennedy the hero. And we learned, read the Sheldon Stern interview in the book, it was all about uh, attempting to make Bobby a hero for purposes of his becoming president. When in fact, that is a total myth. And what the tapes reveal, that during the 13 days of the XCOM meetings, and as everybody's temperature rose, voices rose, blood pressure rose, and, and every single advisor was saying strong retaliation is the only possible way that we can act in order to get Soviet to take these missiles out of Cuba. There was one calm head in the room, one calm voice, one calm decision maker, and that was President John F. Kennedy. And at the end of the 13 days, he succeeded in reaching an agreement with the Soviet Union that caused him to remove the missiles from Cuba, and he thereby uh, avoided World War III. So the next time you see the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., think about Kennedy's calm leadership in the time of the greatest crisis of the second half of the 20th century, and how by, by making a good decision in a calm mode, uh, he was able to prevent World War III and keep us in a mode of enjoying the American way of life, which includes <coughs> enjoying the arts at the Kennedy Center or anywhere else. Commandment seven, a great leader shall be mindful of good timing when pursuing initiatives. Now those who are my age, Bill, Bruce, and others, when we were in college, the great philosopher an anthropologist who we read was a guy named Carlos Castaneda. I don't know if he's still following today. But he had a great quote about, he always called great leaders warriors because he, he had this uh, Latino heritage, Indian heritage. <coughs> warriors slash great leaders recognize the cubic centimeter of chance that can make a break. And when it pops up, they move on it with the necessary speed and prowess to capitalize on the opportunity. And the president, who was the best at moving on the cubic centimeter of chance in the modern era, was Lyndon Johnson. And he gave answers on, and particularly in the way he went about pursuing civil rights legislation initiatives. And so to learn about Lyndon Johnson and civil rights, I interviewed Taylor Branch, the Pulitzer Prize winning civil rights historian, and Mark Abdegro, the head of the LBJ Library, and LBJ Biographer, in my friend Mike Kramer's class at UT Communications Building. There we were in front of the class. I also interviewed Lyndon Johnson's daughter, Linda Johnson Robb, and his White House counsel, Larry Temple. And from there, I learned LBJ's explanation for why, why in the world did he wait until he was president? 
before he started aggressively pushing hard for civil rights legislation. And if you've done any research on LBJ, you know that he was always full of kind of this backcountry, homespun wisdom with these farm metaphors. And so LBJ's explanation for why he waited until he was president to really go after civil rights legislation, he said, you don't ever try to kill a snake until you got the hole in your hand. <laughs> and as president, he had the hope. The snake with the Jim Crow segregation laws. Now, at, before Johnson's presidency, of course, there was, there was JFK, who had spent 15 years in Congress before he became president. And he was kind of a party boy, never took his responsibility seriously by all accounts. And so he had no idea how to get legislation passed. And after he'd been president for more than two years, obviously there was the civil rights movement that was in a state of uproar. Martin Luther King was getting thrown in jail all the time. Uh, it was outrageous. Something had to be done. So uh, in, in early 63, Kennedy finally gave a strong civil rights speech and then submitted a strong civil rights bill to Congress, but it stayed stuck in committee. Nobody could figure out how to get it out until... Kennedy was assassinated. But shortly after his death, LBJ sprung into action, saw the cubic centimeter of chance, strong-armed Congress into getting the bill out of committee onto the floor through a filibuster and passed into law by telling everybody an argument that they couldn't refuse, and that is, we love this man. We love Kennedy. He's our fallen leader. We've got to do something to make a statement for history that will show what he was really all about. And the best way I can think of, let's make him the martyr for the cause of civil rights. And that was an offer nobody could refuse. And that's how he got the Republicans and, uh, to get on board and, and, and the wall came into effect. The same thing happened a year later on voting rights. Nobody knew what to do with voting rights. And then all of a sudden, we had Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama in March of 1965 where police troops were beating up peaceful African Americans who were attempting to march from Selma to Montgomery as a protest over the uh, state of voting rights in, in Alabama at the time. And ABC television was there and it was live and America saw it and America couldn't believe that policemen were beating up peaceful marchers who uh, were totally justified in, in wanting to do something about the status of voting rights in the South at the time. Johnson saw the cubic centimeter of chance. Now's the time. The country's moral outrage. What am I going to do? He got in front of Congress. National television gave his greatest speech. It's called the Great. It's called the We Shall Overcome speech. And the next day he submitted a strong voting rights bill to Congress. And uh, in, in very little time, it became the Voting Rights Act because he knew what would cause people to rethink their positions. And in that case, it was Bloody Sunday. He did the same thing on fair housing. It was stuck in committee. And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther King got assassinated in April 1968. And just like he had done with Kennedy, Johnson got Congress to say, look, this is our fallen leader. We've got to pay a great tribute that's going to make a, a historic statement. Uh, and let's make him, King, Dr. King, the martyr for the cause of fair housing. So after he made that argument, the House finally agreed to accept the Senate version of the bill, and the Housing Rights Act of 1968 uh, became law. So when you're in Washington, D.C., notice the Lyndon B. Johnson Department of Education building. And when you see it, remember LBJ's, by all accounts, one of our greatest presidents in the area, if not our greatest president, that Abraham Lincoln in the field of civil rights, and know that he achieved his success because he knew when to pursue initiatives and when not to. And it was because of that leadership and then that particular trait of leadership that caused the integration of our country to happen quicker and better. Eighth commandment. A great leader shall be a great communicator. But it's more than being a great communicator. You also have to follow through 
on what one says. And the president who communicated best and followed through the best in the modern era was Ronald Reagan. And the people that I interviewed on Reagan for my book were his first term White House Chief of Staff and second term Secretary of the Treasury James Baker and his biographer, Pulitzer Prize finalist H.W. Branch, who's here on the faculty of the University of Texas. Now, I talked to them about many aspects of, of Reagan's life and his greatness, but obviously I wanted to zero in on what, what did he do to make him such a great communi now the communicator. Now, the knee jerk is, oh, well, that's easy. He'd been an actor for the first half of his adult life, and so he knew how to look the camera in the eye and deliver his words with full dramatic force. But Bill Bright said, no, no, no. It, it, it was more than that. It was Reagan's sunny disposition and his cheerful countenance that conveyed a spirit of optimism and it gave Americans hope. And that's what caused him to be the great communicator. Don't we wish we had somebody running for president now who gave us hope and was optimistic about the future. That's what made Reagan the great communicator. James Baker said that it was Reagan's consistent, confident message over time in communicating his steadfast opposition to Soviet communism that built the momentum that led to the Cold War's end. Now, in the modern era, as you know, presidential speeches are created by speechwriters although the boss gets the final say in the final draft. And during Reagan's presidency, uh, his most memorable line as he was attempting to bring an end to the Cold War came when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now the speech with that line went through many drafts. And in every draft, his speechwriters kept taking out that line. They thought it would be too inflammatory toward the Russians. Reagan kept it in. He knew the time was right, June 12, 1987. The place was right, West Berlin's uh, Brandenburg, Brandenburg Gate. And his entire foreign policy message that he had been working on since his first political speech in 1964 had finally arrived at the heck of the speech writers. He gave us the line that will forever give him a special place in our history. But not only did he give us the line, he then followed through, and up until the end of his presidency, led that charge toward the walls coming down the end of the Cold War, which of course happened on his successor's watch, George H.W. Bush. So when you go into D.C. and you go into Reagan Airport, think about aviation, okay, you got to be optimistic, you got to have follow through, you got to be passionate. That's not only important in aviation, that's important in communication. Think about it, all you students. Tear down this wall. Four words, each one syllable. It was clear, and it was strong, and it was passionate, and it was right on the mark, and that's what makes for a great communicator. One thing I've learned in the last few years in communicating, not only when you're preparing speeches to cut out unnecessary words. Be aggressive at cutting out unnecessary syllables. In Lincoln's second inaugural address, it had a grand total with Miles Jordan on the you know speech. It had 702 words. 511 are one syllable. Think about that. Ninth commandment, the great leader shall put the nation's welfare above his own personal the president in modern times who did that best was George H.W. Bush. And for my book, I learned about President Bush from his biographer, Pulitzer Prize winner John Meacham, his Secretary of State, James Baker, his White House Chief of Staff, John Sununu, and his Deputy White House Chief of Staff, Andy Carr. And you all will remember, well, those are our age, will remember the 1988 Republican convention as Bush had received his party's nomination, aspiring to succeed uh, Ronald Reagan as the next president. He said six important words to a national television audience, read my lips. 
Northern Texas. And the convention cheered, and he got elected president in 1988. Now the tax issue was politically huge, but it was also a two-edged sword. The Reagan tax cuts had been very popular, but at the same time they had caused the federal deficit to go up, less tax revenues and expenditures not being cut, the deficit went into places where it had never been before. So upon becoming president, the problem, the problem got serious because countries around the world started reducing the <coughs> T-bills that they purchased over concern about the strength of the American economy, of the economy with the escalating deficit. So when the time came in 1990 for the budget negotiations to take place, and at the time both houses of Congress were controlled by the Democrats who were adamant, we're not cutting spending over anything. So if they're not cutting spending and the deficit is going where it's never gone before, you gotta do something. And so Bush obviously knew as president the country must have somebody who will take seriously this deficit Thus, new taxes were needed. And also, the Iraqi army had just invaded Kuwait. And so he saw looming on the horizon very costly military action that was going to be necessary. And if the taxes stayed low, with an unexpected expensive new war, the deficit would go even farther. So Bush made the decision to put the country first, agreed to new taxes, and there was immediate fallout. It caused a Newt Gingrich-led revolt in the Republican Party, and certainly was a factor in Bush's not being reelected in 1992. Now, could Bush have kept his pledge and refused to uh, agree to new taxes? Of course he could, but if he had, there would have been an impasse in the budget negotiations. We would have had the government shut down, and the, 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 the deficit would have continued to, to spiral, insecure, uh, the, the world thinking less and less of us, and, and, and a, the, what became the Gulf War uh, having to be funded without uh, sufficient revenues, thereby further increasing the deficit. So in Washington, D.C., we have the George Bush uh, Center for the Intelligence, which is the headquarters for the CIA, because Bush was the president of the CIA before he became president. So when you see that building, think of George Bush not only as an intelligent president, but also as a courageous president, because he, he had the courage to put the country first, knowing it would damage his own political interests. Tenth and final commandment. A great leader shall stay abreast of public sentiment, but then find ways to shape it so that it aligns with his own vision. And the president who did that better than anyone was Abraham Lincoln, our greatest president. I say the best for last. Now, Abraham Lincoln once said, public sentiment is everything. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. The Lincoln biographers from my book were Harold Holzer, who's written six books on Lincoln. He is regarded as our most esteemed Lincoln scholar last year. He won the Lincoln Prize. And Ronald White, who's written three terrific books on Lincoln the Third. A. Lincoln, I believe, is the best credit of great biography of Lincoln, came out in 2009 during the Lincoln Bicentennial. Now, on this issue of public sentiment is everything, how do you find, figure out what public sentiment is? Lincoln realized early on that the best way to get your arms around public sentiment was to know what the people who ran the newspapers were thinking. So whenever he went to towns, whether it was a legal business or political business, he always made a stop at the newspaper office. He talked to the publisher, he talked to the editor, he talked to the reporters. He wanted to know the talk of their towns because he couldn't begin to think about shaping their vision to align with his vision unless he knew what they thought. And Harold Holzer pointed out the way he 
went about shaping this vision once he knew the sentiment was through writing newspaper editorials, giving tightly edited eloquent speeches, strategically leaking information to the press on occasion, and writing a letter to the editor of one newspaper but then circulating it uh, throughout uh, the country such that it went viral. So here's an example of Lincoln getting out in front of an issue with his vision and then bringing the public sentiment along to where uh, it aligned with his vision, and that is on the slavery issue during the Civil War. Now, uh, obviously, uh, as of uh, 1862, the war was raging. Lincoln formulated the Emancipation Proclamation, but on the advice of his uh, cabinet, decided to wait to issue it uh, until the Union had achieved a significant victory, which it finally did at Antietam, and then it was, it was finally issued on January 1, 1863. Emancipation Proclamation says nothing about Lincoln's desire to free the slaves out of concern for people of different races being treated uh, unfairly uh, or any aspect of why slavery was bad and why emancipation of, of a race was good. It said nothing about that. What it did say was, I'm issuing the Emancipation Proclamation as a matter of military necessity. Well, in late 1862 and early 1863, there were people sitting on the fence, both in the North and in the border states, about whether we really wanted, they were ready to accept the idea of emancipation. And so to have issued the proclamation and say this was being done on the basis of, of, of the moral high ground associated with abolishing slavery would have caused all kinds of fallout with the people who were still sitting on the fence. But one thing nobody was sitting on the fence about in late 1862 and early 1863 was they wanted the war to end ASAP. Stop the killing, stop the, 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 the injury, stop the disruption, families, lives, you name it. Please bring this horrible war to an end as soon as possible. And you're the commander in chief, and if it's a matter of military necessity, you say we've got to emancipate the slaves, I'm all for it. And there was actually very little pushback on the Emancipation Proclamation. So the next time you go to D.C., you see the Lincoln Memorial and the statue inside of the great emancipator. Look into his eyes. You see his eyes are focused on you. They're focused beyond you. He had a personal vision. He had a long-range vision. Think of Abraham Lincoln as the president who could have that long-range vision and come up with a strategy to bring the public to where it would align with it and thereby make the future better than the present. Now, I want to uh, end my remarks tonight by going back to where we are right now, 45 days away from Election Day, November 8th. And I want you to consider 10 questions I'm about to ask, which are obviously tied to the Ten Commandment lessons of history you just heard. And so think about our choices in the context of the commandment questions. Who's better suited to serve as our conscience in chief? Who's more likely to stay above the partisan fray and build consensus? Who's going to know to recognize its limitations and align with better advisors and recognize and rely upon their strengths? Who's got the better record for persevering over setbacks with steadfast resolve? Who's more likely to play hardball well when necessary? Who's more likely to remain calm and make good decisions in a crisis? Who's more mindful of the cubic centimeter of chance when pursuing initiatives and has a track record for doing that? Who's the better communicator and will actually follow through on what he or she says? Who's going to put the nation's welfare above his own personal interest, his or her own personal interest? And who's going to stay abreast of public sentiment and find ways to shape it? I'm not going to tell you how to answer these questions. 
want you to think about it. I want you to, in the next 45 days, read about both the candidates, watch the debates, talk to people who you have a high regard for, find out where they are, where they're coming from. But I believe these 10 questions tied to the Ten Commandments provide a really sound metric for decision making about who is best equipped to lead our country over the next four years. So, good luck in answering the questions. May we all have good luck on election day and in the years ahead. And I hope that these lessons from history that I have the privilege of learning from 31 people who are the great scholars, the great biographers, and the great people who work inside the White House to attempt to, to together what, what we can learn from the, the, the predecessor presidents and use them to apply to the present and the future. Thank you very much.